Hello everyone, welcome to Albrecht Gardens. Today we are going to be talking about pollinators, but specifically butterflies and the plants that they love and how they help us in the world. We will also be featuring some other of our pollinator friends in short little commercials, just so we can learn a little bit more about them. And we will be totally happy to take all your questions at the end. So keep watching. <laughs> Here is a quick overview of the life cycle. Uh, we start in eggs, grows to a caterpillar, turns into a chrysalis, and then within the chrysalis emerges as a butterfly. And then it repeats the cycle all over again. Say what? The monarch lays a single egg on a milkweed plant. As soon as that egg hatches, the larvae come out and begin to eat and eat until they grow to the size that they need to be to begin their transformation. Here we can see the caterpillar shedding its last layer of skin and turning into its transformation form, the chrysalid. It is attached to the stem by a small piece of silk and it will wiggle its way out of its skin until it can hang peacefully. After the transformation is complete, it breaks out of its chrysalis and begins to dry off its wings. It emerges with small wings, but liquid from the abdomen is pumped through the wings to make them full size, and when they dry off, they are ready to fly. Here's an example of an empty chrysalis. It's hard to picture an entire butterfly fitting in there. Here's our diagram for today. And you can see that there's many parts, uh, a lot more parts than it looks like when you're looking at the butterfly from far away. So um, we start today with the body parts, and not the wings or the antennae, but just the body. There are actually three parts to the butterfly body. The first one is the head, the second one is the thorax where the wings come out, and then the third one is the abdomen, where all the digestion happens. So it's kind of like our abdomen um, right here, you know, where you digest all your food and everything like that. So once we're looking at the head, we can also look at two of the big features of a butterfly. So the first one we're looking at is the antenna. So these antenna come out the top of the head, as you've probably seen before. It tell what time of day it is, and they also help it um, look for stuff. So they help the butterfly kind of get around in the world. In this image, you can see the hairs that help make the antenna extra sensitive. The next, we've got the proboscis. So this is how the butterfly eats. Um, when the butterfly is young, it actually has um, they have something called mandibles, which are their teeth-like structures to chew their food. But then when it becomes a 
and fly it has a proboscis instead. So that's more of like a straw, like if you think of the crazy straws you use when you are drinking a milkshake, that's what it used to see all the time. When the butterfly lands, they extend their proboscis just like this. Moving on to the thorax. There are two types of wings on the butterfly. The ones on the top are called the four wings, and the ones on the bottom are called the hind wings. The most both attach, or all four of them attach to the thorax, right in the middle here. So those are what you see, you know, with all the patterns and everything like that. I know that a butterfly is really beautiful from far away, but did you know when you close, when you close up, actually have a bunch of little tiny scales. So when you look at a butterfly wing up close, it has a lot of scales and that's what we call like the patterns that we see on their wings. That is why wings are so fragile and why we don't want to touch them by the wings if they ever come in contact with us. Despite their wings being fragile, some butterflies do travel long distances for their yearly migration. Take for example the monarch. Every year, these butterflies fly from all over the country down to Mexico to spend the winter there before they return to the northern part of the continent in the summer. There once was a very lonely hummingbird. He flew from plant to plant, gathering nectar and spreading pollen, but he was so sad he thought he was the only bird of his kind. He realized that he was the only bird that he saw that could fly backwards and had wings that could move as fast as his did. He found a feeder and sat there alone eating until he saw another hummingbird fly by. He thought it was a trick of his eye, but then he saw it again. He began to follow the hummingbird to see where it went. As he followed the other hummingbird, he realized they were going to another feeder with many hummingbirds. He was so surprised. He didn't think there were any other of his type around. And now there are many. Now he was the happiest bird alive. And he lived happily ever after with all his friends. To better show how butterflies eat, we have this model while we're here. And you can see it has the leaves, petals, pistils and the stamen of the flower. So those are all the main components of each flower. So when a butterfly gets hungry, they will fly up and land on the flower. And then they will take their proboscis, which is curled up when they fly, just to make it a little more small and more efficient to fly with. So I have my pipe cleaning here all curled up with the proboscis would be. And then once they are landed safely on the flower, we will uncurl it, kind of like a party horn, and then they are ready to drink through the straw. They will find the nectar within the plant, and that can be located pretty much anywhere in the plant. So the butterflies are very good at finding where that would be in the plant. And then they will put their thing down, and sit through it like a straw. And then once they are done finding it in that plant, they will move on to the next one. And then once they are all done eating, they will curl the proboscis all the way back up and make it compact again. Although butterflies mainly eat the nectar out of flowers, that's not the only place they can get nectar from. One of the main things that we used to feed the butterflies here at Ulrich is fruit. So we can find a lot of uh, natural producing fruits like peaches, plums, and mangoes that but butterflies just love to eat. And that would be basically any fruit that is juicy and sweet, but those are the main ones that we use. Uh, butterflies really like those fruits because they produce the same similar nectar to flowers and they are easy for them to land on and drink from. The only drawback to this is that these fruits also attract other things like fruit flies, flies, and other bugs. Uh, and while we love those bugs for other reasons, sometimes we just want to look at the beautiful butterflies. So if you are going to do this at home, just be aware that those other bugs might uh, be attracted to those fruits as well. One of the other things that we use to feed the butterflies here at Ulbrich is just a plain mixture of sugar water. To make this, we mix nine parts water with one part sugar. 
and then we stir and stir until it is all dissolved. And when that is mixed, we pour that over some sponges to make it easier for the butterflies to drink. So they land on those, stick their proboscis into the sponge, and drink as much as they want. And that just makes it easier on them. So if you would like to build your own pollinator feeder kit at home, you can put out these fruits and the sugar water and see what it attracts. Why doesn't anyone think wasps are cool like I do? It's probably because they're misunderstood. These huge black wasps are actually very docile and not really threatening to humans. While they do love to prey on other bugs, they are too shy to approach a human and sometimes don't even like having their picture taken. Well, that makes sense, but then why are they so scary to humans? Most likely because of their size and color. These bugs look kind of scary, but honestly, they're no threat. However, I wouldn't get too close because they can attack if threatened. The absolute best part about these wasps, though, is that they are pollinators and can help plants bloom and flower just like we love about bees. So I was right, wasps are cool. Yes, despite their appearance, they're awesome. Now you can make sure to tell your friend not to run away next time. I'm gonna do that right now, and on my way, thank a wasp. First up, we've got the gray comma. These butterflies can be identified by the unique spots on their back. Fun fact, they breed in both the spring and the summer. Next up, we've got two generations of zebra swallowtails. The first one is the adult, and the second one is the young, early season version. Their zebra-like markings on their back help us identify them. These butterflies lay their eggs one at a time on the pawpaw tree. Our next butterfly here is the red spotted purple. These butterflies stand mostly on their hind legs instead of on their front legs. Despite the name, they are known for their blue color and orange spots. Next up, we've got our question mark butterfly. This one often is confused with the comma, but you can tell them apart by the silver marking on the underside of the question mark's wings, which also look like a dead leaf. Coming up next, we've got the red admiral, which can be spotted by looking for a black butterfly with red spots and white dots. This butterfly has even been known to fly in the winter in some parts of the world. Next, we've got the morning cloak. This butterfly has a dark brown center with some blue spots and yellow around the edges. It is also the state insect of Montana. Coming in next is our tiger swallowtail, which can be identified by its bright yellow color and stripes. The females have a blue color at the tip of their wings and the males are just yellow and black. One that we don't have a cutout of, but is still very important, is the cabbage white. These butterflies can be identified by their bright white color and the spots on their back. These butterflies are extremely common in Wisconsin and can be seen in almost every garden. It is named this because it will always lay its eggs on a cabbage plant, whether that be wild or cultivated. Last but certainly not least is our monarch butterfly. These can be identified by their orange color and white spots around their wings. The only thing that the larvae eat is milkweed. As you all probably know, there are many different colors of flowers that butterflies and other pollinators are attracted to. So we're going to be going through a few types of those flowers and their colors and create a rainbow of flowers that we can use to attract pollinators. So the first color we've got is red. That is the beginning of the rainbow. We've got our red flower here. That's our little red portion there. So there are a few types of red flowers, not too many in Wisconsin, but they are can, but they can be native to Florida and other more southern regions. Again, there's not too many that are native to Wisconsin, but they can grow here. We do grow some red flowers in the garden. First up, we've got the cardinal flower, which is usually native to the southern part of the United States. Next, we have the blanket flower, whose colors inspired the colors 
for Texas State University. Our next color is orange. We've got our orange here. There are a lot of flowers in Wisconsin that are orange that are native to Wisconsin. And you can find them all around the garden and probably a lot of wildflowers too. For our forest orange, we have butterfly milkweed, which is named that way because butterflies love its color. Next, we have the scarlet globe mallow. Even Lewis and Clark took a sample of these flowers. So our next color that's coming up is yellow. And the yellow is a very common flower color that attracts butterflies and bees and other pollinators like that because it is so bright and it reflects the sun very, very much. It is so bright. And I'll be using a green marker for that one, just so it's a little easier to see. Our first native yellow plant is the cup plant. This plant can be used for energy, animal feed, pollination, and even medical uses. Next, we've got the showy goldenrod, which has three different varieties. These varieties can be found all over the U.S. So our next color would be green, but actually there are no um, real pollinator flowers that are mainly green color. As you probably know, flowers will grow and their leaves and their stems are green. There's not too many green flowers. And even if there were, they're not too bright. Um, and we just consider green to be a part of all flowers. So there's not any specifically green flowers that are pollinator attracting. So then we can skip right on down to blue. And a lot of the blue flowers that we can find actually look like they're purple, but they're considered blue. So it can be hard to identify the blue flowers just because, like I said, they might be identified as purple. But we also do have purple, and you'll see a difference in just a second. Our first blue plant is the wild lupine. This plant has many varieties and some are even known to make delicious meals. Next we have the great blue lobelia. This plant does not pollinate itself and must rely on pollinators to live. So next we are moving on to purple and these are a little brighter and lighter than the blue flowers. So there is a clear difference and they both work really well to attract our pollinators because they are bright and very unique in the landscape. There's not a lot of natural colors like blue and purple um, in trees and other places in nature, so they work really well to attract our pollinators that way. Our first purple flower is the purple coneflower, and its scientific name actually translates to spiny one. Then we have the field thistle. This plant works well to attract pollinators because of its bright color and large size. So then our next color is pink. And I know that it's not part of the rainbow that we usually see, but there are quite a few pink flowers that we can find in Wisconsin and in other places um, that can attract our pollinators really well. And I'll be using red for this one. first pink here is the Joe Pye weed, which is actually a member of the sunflower family. Next is the swamp milkweed, which works well for pollinators because of the strong sweet smell it puts off. And then our last color is actually white, which you don't usually think of as a color, but it is bright and it does attract a lot of pollinators because of its brightness and reflection in the sun. So it is a very common flower color, which you don't usually think of, but there we are. Our first white one is the Virginia Mountain Mint, which as its name implies, puts off a strong mint scent when it is crushed. Our final plant today is the Calico Aster, which blooms so late in the season it adds color to late gardens. And now we've got our beautiful rainbow garden. Now we will have all types of 
types of pollinators coming to visit us from all around. This is what a good pollinator garden could look like. So for our next guest today, we have the flower. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so you know, I like hanging out in gardens or in forests or you know, kind of anywhere that you find plants. Like plants are all over the world. So flowers are all over the world. And um, as you can see, I have some pretty bright colors on my flower. Not all flowers are brightly colored, but you know, I kind of like my pink color. And the really nice thing about my pink color is lots of different insects and animals also like my pink color. So, you know, it's nice because they'll come visit me and that helps them come find me even though there's so many other flowers in the garden True. so you have like a lot of friends oh yeah tons of friends i like to see the butterflies sometimes the bees come by i've seen a hummingbird every once in a while wow even that so yeah lots of friends i'm pretty popular <laughs> okay. that's really great so what are you working on right now that's a really good question so actually, what's really nice about having so many friends is that they all bring me something every time they visit. They're really generous. So they like to bring me pollen, and I give them nectar in return. And nectar is super sweet, like so sugary. So they really, really like that. It gives them a lot of energy. So they bring me the pollen, I give them the nectar, and then they help me make fruit. So right now, I'm working on an apple. And the apples usually have seeds, and those seeds help me grow more plants, which means more flowers and more friends. Oh my gosh, that is really amazing. Yeah. Something else I would probably mention about being such a great flower like I am is I smell really good. Not all flowers smell really good. For example, some of them smell like rotting meat. What? Yeah. That's crazy. But there are insects that like that and they help those flowers. I smell good, so I don't really worry about those things, but yeah. All kinds of different smells can attract different types of animals. Wow. Well, I have to know, does it hurt when an animal comes and uses your nectar? Oh, not at all. That's like how our relationship works, right? They give me the pollen, I give them the nectar, and usually they're so little that they just kind of land, hang out for a little bit, and then fly off again. Well, that is quite the relief, because we definitely don't want you getting hurt. Oh, no. My <laughs> friends are super nice. That's a good news. So mainly you said you have butterflies that come to you. Is that kind of the main one? Yeah, I would say butterflies are the main friends that I have that come hang out with me in the garden. They really like bright colors. They are very attracted to nectar. And they tend to need a lot of it. So yeah, I would say mostly butterflies come to where I need them. really fun. <laughs> Where can we find you in the future? You can always find me at Ulrich Botanical Gardens. There are so many of us here. We're all different colors, all different shapes, all different sizes, and I'll definitely be out in the garden. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me. So we are starting here at the Ulrich entrance. If you look to the left, you will see our first pollinator garden. We will walk over there and see what they have. You can see here 
that this area is indicated by one of our Monarch Way Station signs. This means that this is an area that monarchs like to congregate while they are migrating. We have many pollinator plants in this area, but this is by no means all of the pollinator plants that we've got in the garden. This is just a great place to start if you'd like to see some butterflies. Next, we are headed in through the lobby and out to the garden. whites flying around all along the pathway. Now that we have reached the sunken garden, you can see that there are a lot of brightly colored plants, which will attract a lot of pollinators, especially butterflies. One of the main flowers in this area is the purple coneflower, which you can see with the orange heads and the purple petals. These will attract a lot of bees and butterflies and are really great for a pollinator garden. Next, we are headed to the herb garden. So here next to our back entrance of the herb garden, we have a large pollinator area which will attract many bees and butterflies along with beetles as well. You can see all the bright colors that would cause this. Next we are walking through the herb garden and going to the path that leads to the perennial garden. On our way we will be making some stops at some points and these plants are known to attract many pollinators but especially bees. First up here is at one of our allium gardens. This garden is known to have many, many bees flying around, as you might be able to see on the video here, as they really, really like the allium. If you ever visit our garden, make sure to take a stop here and all around the garden, wherever you find allium, and spot some bees. We also have our purple cone flower here, which, as we talked about before, is a great plant for pollinators. we will continue our journey back to the perennial garden, passing some meadows on the way, which are also good for pollinators. And now we have reached the perennial garden. As we walk up, we can see all of the bright colors once again, attracting all of the pollinators and other bugs to the area. This is another really popular place to spot butterflies, as butterflies of all kinds gather to these plants. There are also many bees and moths. I was even able to spot a monarch on one of our plants here while filming. Notice its wings and spots on its body. And remember that its wings are actually made up of those tiny little scales that we looked at before. And if you look closely, you can even see it using its proboscis to drink the nectar. After this, we are going to make our way around the back of the garden so we can eventually get to the moon moonlight garden and the event garden where we can see many more pollinators. On the way, we will be making a few stops. stopping to look at a cabbage white butterfly. Our first stop here is at our large patch of milkweed plants. As we talked about before, a lot of our monarchs will be stopping at our milkweed plants to lay their eggs and make sure their caterpillars will grow. Next, we are making our way to the Moonlight Garden. 
As you can see, we've passed some bright flowers and some more grass and meadow area. And these are very important for pollinators too, as they will pollinate these plants. But as they don't have flowers, they are not part of our pollinator attraction squad. Now we have arrived in the Moonlight Garden. And as you can see, there are way more of these white flowers that we talked about before. And these flowers do a really good job of attracting pollinators and helping out with the pollination process despite them not being as brightly colored as we would imagine. Next we will head over to our event garden. On our way we will pass some of our bee houses and some more pollinator plants as you can tell from the bright colors once again. As we enter here, you will begin to see many of our blue flowers. That's because our Pantone color of the year this year is classic blue. So this way you can see many of the examples of the blue flowers we were talking about before. Hummingbirds especially like this area because there are many flowers that they enjoy drinking the nectar of. So if you ever come visit, definitely keep your eye out for the hummingbirds. While walking through this area, I did notice many bees as well. As we exit the event garden, you can see many areas that are empty, just waiting for more pollinator plants to be planted. Here we are again approaching our favorite bee plants. These flowers are always filled with bees, collecting their nectar and their pollen to help other plants and themselves. As we exit the garden, we walk under our wisteria plant, which is also a helpful pollinator plant. Even though our garden tour is ended for the day, that doesn't mean we can't keep our eye out for pollinator plants in our world around us. Welcome to our children's kitchen garden. Here we grow many plants like squash, potatoes, garlic, onions, basil, tomatoes, zucchinis, and many more. As we walk around the children's kitchen garden, remember that pollinators not only help flowers, but many other plants as well. The fruits and vegetables that we grow here bloom with flowers before they can ever make their crop. This means that they also need pollinators so that they can grow and produce food for us to eat. As you can see, our garden is lined with many pollinator plants to encourage bees, butterflies, beetles, wasps, and hummingbirds to fly around and pollinate our vegetables and fruits so that we can grow many, many things. Although Sarah and I find these fruits and vegetables super yummy, the best part is that we are able to donate many of these crops to local food banks like Second Harvest and the Goodman Community Center. So if you really think about it, this means that bees and butterflies and all of our other pollinator friends are helping us feed the city and helping people in need. Ultimately, we need all of our pollinator friends 
so that all of us can eat and stay happy and healthy. Think of your favorite fruit or vegetable. Now imagine a world in which our pollinator friends don't exist. Wouldn't be able to eat this ever again, and many of your other favorite foods wouldn't exist either. This is why we are so passionate about helping pollinators and giving them places to rest and eat. They make our world much more colorful and exciting to live in. Though sometimes they can be scary like the wasp or beautiful like the butterfly, they are all helpful in their own way. Ultimately, it is in our best interest to consider them friends rather than enemies and try and support them as much as we can. If we can help them, they will help us right back. This garden is a great visual example of how much pollinators help us in our everyday lives. We would never be able to make this much food if it weren't for them. And the beautiful flowers of Ulbrick wouldn't exist either. For example, the production of this cucumber was made possible by all of our pollinator friends. And if we look next to our human food, we can see much of our pollinator friends' food, like this milkweed. Our monarchs help us, so we want to help them too. Pollinators and humans play a big role in each other's lives, and we should be grateful. So if you see a pollinator friend, be sure to say thank you and let them know that you are always willing to help. One of these possible careers is butterfly farmer. These farmers raise butterflies from eggs and sell them to different places around the continent and let people put on shows like our blooming butterflies. This does, however, take a lot of work and a lot of space as you need places to raise caterpillars, eggs, and the adult butterflies. There are also many rules and regulations as we want to prevent invasive species from forming but it can be very rewarding watching the butterflies grow. Our next potential job is entomologist or somebody who studies bugs. These scientists have a passion for insects and would like to find out why they look like they do, why they act like they do, and what benefit they bring others. Entomology falls under the category of zoology, which is the study of animals. Their studies are very helpful for understanding the world around us, because bugs really influence everything. So if you like collecting and observing bugs, this might be the job for you. If you want to get a little more specific and study butterflies only, you might want to become a lepidopterist. These entomologists work only with butterflies, studying how they fly, migrate, eat, and other things. These scientists also study moths. Lepidopterists will collect samples and study their species with those. Much of our current knowledge about moths and butterflies has come from Lepidopterists. If you feel drawn to butterflies and moths, maybe this is the job for you. If bees and honey are more your speed, then we've got the job for you. Beekeepers are also considered honey farmers. They keep their bees in hives and boxes and harvest the honey when it's time. The beekeeper does not control the bees and lets them go where they want, when they want. The bees will often return to their hive with the beekeeper because they know it is safe. Some people do it as a hobby and other people do it as a job. And some even use their bees to help farmers pollinate. If you want to help the bees, this might be the job for you. If you'd rather work on the plant side of pollination, you can always be a horticulturist. Horticulture falls under the study of botany, which is the study of all plant life. Horticulturists specifically work with edible and ornamental arrangements. Many of the gardeners you see here at Ulbrick are horticulturists. They cultivate and create beautiful landscapes, and they know exactly how each plant will react to where it's planted. They rely on pollinators to keep their landscapes looking beautiful, and in return, they plant pollinator plants for the pollinators to survive. So if you think plants are more your thing, maybe this is right for you. If you simply can't wait to get your hands on a garden, you can always start your own. You don't need to be an expert to plant a pollinator garden. All you need is a little bit of soil, a place to plant, and some patience. Pick out some native pollinator plants for your area and plant those first so they thrive. Here in Madison, you can even register your pollinator garden as an official pollinator habitat. This is a great way to say thank you to the butterflies, bees, moths, hummingbirds, beetles, and wasps that help you out every day. Once again, if we help them, they'll help us right back. Have fun planting a rainbow of your own. 
Overall, I hope you never forget about our pollinator friends and how much they help us every day. Thank you so much for joining us in the garden today, and we hope to see you soon. Hello, and now we're going to welcome our guests here. Let me make sure they're both on. So please welcome to your screen, Ellen Schubel and Sarah Ellis. Um, and are you guys both ready to answer questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Looks like we already have one question. You want to go ahead? Yeah, I can answer this one, Ellen. Um, the question is, isn't the zinnia a green flower? Do butterflies go to them? Uh, so there is actually a wide variety of zinnias. There are green cultivars and there are also pink and yellow and white. Uh, they come in a lot of different colors. But in general, zinnias are going to be a great addition to a butterfly or pollinator garden. We'll wait for a couple questions here. If you have a question, please um, click the Q&A icon and type in the text box with your question. Ladies, do you have anything else you want to share about Obrick? Maybe the hours or anything like that? Sure. We are currently open every day, uh, 12 to 6. And our conservatory is not open at the moment uh, just because of the guidelines with gathering and whatnot. It's a little bit smaller of a space, but the outdoor gardens are open and you're welcome to walk those anytime. Um, we actually also have a big event coming up, which is Gleam. That's our nighttime art installation. So we light up the garden with installations from a whole bunch of different artists. And we actually have an installation that includes butterflies. So you should definitely come and check that out. It starts at the end of August. Looks like we have some questions now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Ellen, are any of these standing out to you or should we just go in order? Uh, we can go in order if you'd like. <laughs> um, okay. How many colors of plants are there? I honestly don't know. Um, I think that for the most part, the entire spectrum of the rainbow, um, if you mean here at Ulbrich, we definitely try to incorporate every color of flower um, and plant in our garden. The variety helps in attract insects like Ellen mentioned in uh, her video. Um, and it also makes our garden beautiful for people to come and visit, so. Um, so it looks like the next question here is how many types of butterflies are at Old Brick? Um, well, there's not like a set amount that we see every year. Um, our most common are definitely the cabbage whites. Um, those are everywhere. <laughs> um, as you might've seen in the video, um, they are, yeah, everywhere. We do have a lot of monarchs as well, but there definitely can be other types. Any of those native types that I mentioned in the video, they have all been spotted uh, around Madison. So uh, keep your eyes out for those. But yeah, the cabbage whites and the monarchs are kind of our big uh, butterflies that we've got here. Our next question is, can milkweed harm other plants like in the veggie garden? Uh, milkweed can get really robust. So if you were planning to have it in your garden, I would just keep an eye on it, maybe pull some so that it doesn't get as spread out, especially if you wanna kind of keep it to one area as your pollinator garden versus your veggie garden. Um, in general, all plants are going to have some benefits to each other, like some are nitrogen fixers, which is great for the soil and it helps provide benefits to all the other plants around them. But we noticed, for example, in the kitchen garden that Ellen showed in the film, there's milkweed everywhere. So we definitely had gone through and pulled it in a few places so that some of our vining plants weren't vining around the milkweed um, or that it wasn't shading some of our smaller plants like our beans and things like that. So um, usually it's going to be fine, but it, it can grow quickly and it can spread. Um, looks like our next question is, what's your favorite butterfly? <laughs> Um, personally, I really like the swallowtail variety of butterflies just because they're so big and they're so like noticeable. <laughs> I just think it's so fun that there is a bug that is that size. <laughs> 
Uh, I have two. I really like the blue spotted purple. They have a really iridescent blue on their wings, kind of similar to like a morpho butterfly. If you've ever seen one of those, those are very blue. And then um, every once in a while in our butterfly exhibit, we get malachites and those are this really pretty green color and they look really awesome when they're kind of up against the windows because the light shines through their wings really easily. So those are my two favorites. Cool. Uh, the next question is, when the new butterfly emerges from chrysalis, does the mom and dad still care or teach it? No, actually, uh, the usually what happens is a butterfly will lay an egg on a bunch of different plants. So there'll be one plant here that has an egg and then maybe a little bit farther away, there's another plant that has an egg and they kind of spread them all out so that they have space to grow and that there aren't too many caterpillars competing for the same plant and the same leaves. So they usually fly away by the time the uh, um, new butterfly is going to emerge from their chrysalis. But luckily they know exactly what to do when they come out. They, they have it already ingrained, it's in their mind. They know that when they come out of their chrysalis, they're gonna hang and pump up their wings and let them dry. And then as soon as they're ready to fly, they start looking for food. So they fly off and they start looking for nectar. All right. Um, sorry, can you take the next one? <laughs> yeah, do butterflies need pollen for anything? Uh, not really. They are definitely uh, going to plants looking for the nectar um, because as you saw in the video, they have those really long tongues, that proboscis. So only liquid can get through there. Um, actually, you have to be really careful sometimes, uh, especially if you're making sugar water and things like that, that you get the ratio right because it can otherwise clog their proboscis and then they can't eat as well. Um, so they really are just kind of like the bees. They're, they're looking for that nectar and and the pollen is just going to stick to their body because they have all those hairs on their legs. So they are just a vehicle. They help carrying the pollen to other plants for us. I can take this next one. Um, it says, will the video you showed be available on your website? Yes. Um, on the Lakeside Kids page of the Monona Terrace website, um, we have posted all of the videos from our Lakeside Kids program this summer. Awesome. Um, looks like the next question is, how many kinds of butterflies are there? Um, there are actually over 17,000 species of butterflies, so a whole lot. <laughs> um, butterflies and moths are kind of one of the most diverse like bug types that we have. Um, in Wisconsin, there are a lot fewer. Um, we only have like a few hundred species that are native here. Of course, some might, you know, travel through, but um, just around the world, there are actually over 17,000. So many. <laughs> uh, next question is, why are there green flowers when the pollinators like bright flowers? Uh, well, so if you've looked up any pictures of green flowers or if you've been in our garden, the green is still pretty bright when it's compared to the other plants around it. So the, the top of the flower is like more of a neon green, whereas the leaves are going to be a darker color. So there's still a contrast. You can still tell the difference. The pollinators can still tell the difference. Also, some insects like bees, they see colors differently than we do. So it may appear green to us, but it may appear hot pink to them, right? So the, the colors can be seen differently by different insects. And then um, there are pollinators that, are, that we didn't include. So even ants can be pollinators. So sometimes uh, different insects are attracted to different colors. Um, so that's also why. And then because of science and our ability to create and make different types of plants based on which ones we um, have pollinate to each other, we're able to create a lot of different colors. So green was a color I think that somebody wanted to see if they could make and they can. So now we have green flowers. All right, the next question here, it looks like, are there any gray flowers? Um, not really. <laughs> um, they're definitely not as naturally occurring. So there definitely can be like, you can find them in a bouquet more than you can find them in a garden. So you can definitely like 
dye the flowers gray or like crossbreed them. Um, there's some purple flowers that are really light purple that do look gray, like some irises can definitely look gray, but they're technically considered purple. Um, but yeah, more of the naturally occurring flowers are not going to be gray, but you can definitely find them <laughs> if you want to and like cross breed them if you really need them. <laughs> The next question is, have murder bees made it to Wisconsin? So I think this is referring to the Asian giant hornet that's been found in Washington state. Uh, it has been, for the most part, as far as I know, contained to Washington state. Uh, they are working really hard to make sure that it stays there and that they can eradicate it so that it doesn't harm our honeybee population. Um, there are a lot of beekeepers that are actually helping with a citizen science project in that area by creating traps for the hornets so that they can study them and see um, what their patterns are. Um, something really interesting about them is that they're really hot. The, the hornets are hot. And so uh, what scientists are doing is they're going out into the woods and they're using infrared scanners to find out where the nests are with the hornets because on the scanner it's going to show up as like this big ripe bread ball that's where it's really really warm whereas everything else is going to be a little bit cooler around it so it's really interesting what they're doing and we're very lucky that they haven't made it all the way over here yet so our bees are safe <laughs> all right looks like the next question is how or what is the most common butterfly in north america um, and again, that is the cabbage white, <laughs> or that's one of the most common, um, and it's the most common that you'll see lying around any garden. They aren't, um, so they'll um, lay their eggs and eat any sort of cabbage that they can find, and cabbage is very common and very easy to grow, and it'll grow anywhere. So um, the cabbage whites are probably the most common in North America, although I'm not sure about other countries, unfortunately. <laughs> Our next question is, how big is Ulbrich? Very good question. Ulbrich is 16 acres of outdoor space. Um, so that is probably hard to visualize, but uh, it's a pretty big space. We have a variety of different gardens here um, that all have different names. And then we have special um, gardeners named horticulturists who take care of each of those gardens. And then we actually have space across Starkweather Creek, which is where our Thai Sala is. Um, and that was a gift from the university and from the Thai students that attend there. Um, so that is a little bit away from our building, but it's still only like a 10 minute walk to get out there. I would say most people that come here spend at least an hour walking the gardens and even then you probably wouldn't cover everything. So I think it's the perfect size to spend a good afternoon in, but you can always come back and see more. All right, looks like our next question is, why do some butterflies have patterns? Uh, so the main reason that butterflies have patterns is for attracting a mate. So um, they're bright colored um, outer wings. So when you see when they open their wings and the patterns that we recognize as common butterfly patterns, those are often for attracting mates and things like that. But when they close their wings, um, when they're the non-pattern side, that is for camouflage. So a lot of them will look like leaves as you might've seen in the video. Um, so that predators don't take a bite of them thinking that they're a butterfly rather than they are a leaf. So on the top, like I said, like the bright colors are more for finding a mate and then the bottom are for camouflage. Okay, um, next question we'll take is what's your favorite flower? Uh, my favorite flower is the hyacinth. Um, they can get really tall and they come in mostly kind of blues and purple colors and purple is my favorite color so I really like those. I'm really basic. I just like lilies. <laughs> they're so common and I just think they're very, very pretty. <laughs> they're great. <laughs> um, how are some monarch caterpillars mostly black? That's a good question. Ellen, do you have any ideas? I, so, I mean, it really depends. Every caterpillar is different depending on which kind of milkweed they are laid on and what they have been eating. Um, and just like humans, they all are a little bit different. They're not all gonna be the same. 
Um, but yeah, it really depends on what they ingest um, when they are young. And yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so it looks like our next question is, what is the chrysalis made of? Um, so it's actually the, it's like a layer of skin-like substance. Um, so they shed their last caterpillar skin, and then underneath that, it has grown a, another membrane, which hardens and um, forms the chrysalis. Um, so it's actually like part of them which is kind of surprising because you would think that <laughs> it's just another shell, but it's more of a layer of skin as a membrane rather than them like turning inside out or growing another layer. I've heard it kind of compared to like your, your fingernails, right? They're, mm -hmm. They can be really thick, but they can also be really thin. And our fingernails are made of a protein that our body produces. So it's, it's kind of the same idea. Like it, ours keeps growing, obviously, but the, the butterfly's chrysalis is that shell that is hard enough to keep them safe, but soft enough for them to actually get out of once they're ready to emerge. Do butterflies and moths have the same ancestors? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't really know. Uh, like if they were the same thing and then diverged into two different things. I am, I'm not sure. Ellen, do you have any ideas or have you read anything about that? Um, there's definitely, uh, they think that they, they came from the same ancestors. They know all butterflies came from the same ancestor. Um, they think that maybe a little farther back, uh, moths diverge from that as well, but they haven't quite reached that point yet in their research to say definitively. So they think so, but <laughs> we're not totally sure yet. <laughs> that would be a good opportunity to become a lepidopterist. You could learn <laughs> some more about that. Uh, when is the inside of Ulbricht going to open? Uh, if you're referring to the conservatory, uh, we are still working with public health and with the city of Madison to determine when it will be safe to open the conservatory again. Like I said before, it's kind of a small space. I know it seems really large, but once you get down to how many people we're allowed to have in indoor spaces, um, it's still kind of small. So we're working very hard to figure out when that can be. Um, and we are just waiting from word from public health and the guidelines on keeping everybody safe. Uh, we are hopefully looking to have it open by October, but we'll just have to wait and see what they say. We'll keep you posted. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, it looks like our next one is, are dragonflies related to butterflies? Um, not really. Really the only thing they have in common is that they're both insects um, and that's um, basically where the similarities stop. Um, they don't eat the same things. They don't have the same body shapes or types. Well, they have the three parts and the six legs just like every bug. <laughs> um, but um, butterflies and moths are definitely um, shown to be more related than dragonflies and butterflies. Okay. You want to take the next one too? Yeah, and I think we'll make this the last one. Um, oh, sorry. That's no, okay. <laughs> uh, so it looks like the next one is how do butterflies fly with scales on their wings? So the scales overlap like a lot. <laughs> um, the scales can overlap so much that they create like one solid layer. And the scales are well, scales are so small and they attach to a membrane. So it's like, a, <laughs> I don't really know how to compare it. Like if you're putting um, tissue paper on a piece of construction paper, like that would create one solid layer. But um, so it's not just a bunch of little tiny scales floating in the air. <laughs> they overlap and they connect to each other in the membrane. So they're able to have like a solid wing. Um, but it has scales making it up. Does that make any sense? <laughs> They're also really, really, really small. So the only way you can see them is under a microscope. And so all those overlapping layers, they, the weight of them isn't heavy to the butterfly because of how small they are. Yes. 